Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's event um, at the John Rylands Library. Um, we're very glad to be doing this as part of the um, first Libraries Festival here at Manchester. My name is John McAuliffe. I'm Professor of Poetry um, at the University of Manchester's Centre for New Writing. And today, I'm very happy to be introducing two of my great colleagues at the university, um, Jessica Smith and Professor Michael Schmidt. Jess Smith joined the Rylands in 2016, having previously worked as an archivist at Unilever, at Lancashire County Council and elsewhere. And she is now creative arts archivist at the university with charge of what is a vast archive and an uh, archive which is increasing in size all the time. She has a key role in a number of projects which draw on the stores of paper and digital archives here at the university, as well as being host of the excellent Rylands podcast, which went out during the first lockdown. Vibrant, radiant, steeped in the modernist tradition is what John Ashbery had to say about Michael Schmidt's selected poems. Michael is the author of, most recently, the collection Talking to Stanley on the Telephone and Gilgamesh, The Life of a Poem. He has overseen Carcanet Press for 51 years and has edited the brilliant poetry journal PN Review for nearly as long. One of the prime movers in the establishment of the modern literary archive here at the Rylands, it's a pleasure to see him back in this, which is certainly one of his many elements. So, 15 months ago or so, um, the three of us were due to be here on the opening night of uh, an exhibition which was going to celebrate um, Carcanet Press's 50th anniversary. Um, that gives some sign of exactly how far back the relationship between poetry and the library has gone. And what I'm going to do now is begin by asking Jess um, and Michael about their first experiences of the archives and about the work they have done with archives um, during their careers. So Jess, can you tell us about how you first got involved in archive work? Absolutely, yes. Um, I've been qualified as an archivist for about 10 years actually. Um, I have an MA in Archives and Records Management um, and initially I did some voluntary work in a library and I loved it so much that I wondered if there was some way of making, you know, making a special, more specialist profession out of it and of course th that led me to the special collections quite naturally. Um, and that was at the University in the States actually when I was doing my undergrad degree. Um, and then since then I've worked in archives in chari in, 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 for charities and businesses at various universities. And as you say, ended up here in 2016 to catalogue part of the Guardian newspaper archive. Um, and then I was very fortunate to get the role of creative arts archivist uh, back in 2018. So about been here about two and a half years now in this role. And I look after probably 160 archives altogether, um, which is, um, we were like so modern literary, we're talking maybe 18th century to the present, so everything through to 20th, 21st century. And these collections are still accruing, so I, I get to spend a lot of time with archives uh, from, from all kinds of different genres and all kinds of different, um, different areas. So I look after the literary, performing arts and visual arts archives, which is something of a wide, um, wide collecting area. Um, but it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and what's, what is the main difference between the work you do as a creative arts archivist and say the kinds of work you were doing previously for charities and for other kinds of organisation? Uh, that's a good question. I think fundamentally that some of the work doesn't change. It's, it's the material that we're looking after and the things we're able to do with it that changes. So for example, at Lancashire Council, I was looking after the adoption records for the previous 150 years, which have a very crucial and important role for individuals, whereas I think some of the collections here perhaps have had a, a more wide-ranging kind of, kind of impact. Um, certainly with literary archives, uh, we, we have researchers from all over the world that are incredibly interested, particularly in Carcanet Press, mm. of course. Michael, I might turn to you now and ask you, one of the things I remember when I first came to Manchester was somebody showing me your correspondence with Elizabeth Bishop, which, um, uh, where she's talking about your first books of poems um, in a very complimentary fashion. But I, I wondered if, if you could talk a little bit about your first contact with the archive um, as a phenomenon, as a student maybe, uh, and then it preceded my time as a student. My grandmother kept an archive. Everything that I sent her and that other people sent her, she kept in, in great, with great tidiness in Calhoun, Georgia. And my mother uh, saved ev absolutely everything 
I ever sent her, and in a very orderly fashion. These, these, well, at least my mother's archive, as it were, is now here as part of the Rylands archive. Um, it was always very useful to me to be able to refer back to things that I had been, been doing. But um, I think my real excitement with archives is when I was a mere apprentice nerd. And um, I used to spend all my spare time uh, in Mexico City, where I grew up, in, in the um, archaeological museum, first of all in the center of town, and then the great uh, modern, it was built 50, 60 years ago, um, c collection. And what was exciting there was that uh, I loved pre-Columbian art. Um, and it separated out the different cultures and put them in chronological order. So I spent most of my time in the Totonac room, but um, it, was, it was just a wonderful way of displaying a lot of material, as it were, in a co comprehensible way. Um, and so when I came to England and we set up Carcanet, um, I too became a hoarder. And, and I can't tell you what a relief it is when somebody takes the hoard away from you and, and looks after it for you, because then you, you get a lot of space back. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about how that process started? How, how did, how did your, your own archive and Carcanet's archive build up this relationship with this big building here in the centre of town? Uh, yes, I was employed here by, by, um, by, by Professor Brian Cox, one of our antecedents in this, in this august place, uh, as a, I guess I, I wasn't a creative writing fellow, I was simply a visiting academic, as it were, and, I, and that turned into a lectureship and so on. Um, and I was given a, a, an office in the basement of the, of the university library where they stored the PhDs. And I remember Fred Ratcliffe, who was the librarian there, coming down one day and, and finding me puffing on my pipe and being rather ups, upset that I was smoking in the library. I wasn't doing any damage to these unreadable PhDs in any event. He and I became quite friendly. And at a certain point, I asked him whether you know, there was space in the library for this, all this, this waste paper I was accumulating. And he, he took he took counsel. He rang the librarian at Hull uh, and asked him whether he should acquire, <laughs> acquire the Carcanet archive. And the librarian at Hull had been very disobliging about Carcanet to certain people, like, like Andrew Motion and others, who he said, don't, don't be published by them. They're just, they're, they're just starting off. They're not nowhere. Um, and he told Fred Ratcliffe to acquire the archive. So from that point on, uh, the rest is the rest is well history of course. Do so you want to <laughs> remind everybody who was the librarian at home? Oh yes, the, that was Philip Larkin. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> very good. And that correspondence maybe features in the archive. Uh, it, well, it, it, only Fred Radcliffe left his papers to or gave his papers to the uh -huh. library. I, there are a few letters to me from Larkin, um, which are very polite. <laughs> <laughs> I actually put a letter in the exhibition, which is them saying hello, we, Michael, saying thank you very much for taking the archive. We'd be delighted to give you more. So, we do. <laughs> and more and more. <laughs> it's the gift that keeps, or the, the purchase that keeps, that keeps purchasing, isn't it? It just right? keeps, yeah. Just keep. <laughs> um, I wonder, Jess, if you could talk a little bit about that, about how you, like, you know, the digital archive at um, a press and presumably in every kind of archive that you're dealing with now, an awful lot of the work is, is, is coming from that sort of virtual environment. Um, and the Rylands was very fast to commit to kind of preserving that work as well, which must be um, wonderful. <laughs> it's, a, it's a new set of challenges for us, for sure, as, as, as an entire profession. Um, I, I love that you think we've been quick at that. I think we, we've, been, we've been worrying about it for a couple of decades. Um, but we are now, of course, as you say, acquiring digital archives and digital material, uh, which forms then a hybrid archive with the paper collection. Um, so we can point people in different directions. Um, the lion's share of that for Carcanet, of course, is the email archive, which we've been bringing in since 2012. Um, my wonderful predecessor, Fran Baker, um, did some really groundbreaking work there, bringing in some of the first email archives that we, we'd ever had and um, continue to be the only archives, actually, we have. Um, but that it requires, as you say, completely different workflows and completely different preservation mm. considerations. And uh, it, the access is more complicated as well, so we're very much we're working on all of that at the moment. Um, speaking of access, I wonder if you could tell us about who are the users, who, who comes and uses these archives and, you know, at the moment and who do you imagine maybe in future will be um, coming to find out about the information and the knowledge which is stored here? Um, we have, oh, we have, you know, inquiries from all over the world. Um, of course, we have the researchers that come in, academic researchers, researchers who are really just fans, you know, fans of the poetry, fans of the work. And we, we've always been a public library and we've always been open 
to everybody. So we, the, there was a real sense of you know promoting e equality of access, despite regardless of what you were you know what you were interested in doing with with the material. Um, we get a lot of students as well, of course, students at the university, students at lots of different universities. Um, we had a group from. Bolton come in in my time and you know various other local places people from Liverpool come um, so people are uh, yeah people are completely fascinated by our archives and by Karkana in particular um, and yeah it'd be difficult to pin down I guess a, a, an individual group yes yeah Michael one of the things that strikes me is how the dimension which is introduced to how we read the work of these poets um, that Karkana have published can be altered or seen in a different light by what's in the archives. And I wondered if there are, if you can think of poets whose correspondence has introduced a different sense of what their work does for you as a, as a reader and as an editor. Um, when I was starting off, I was, I, obviously we had our younger poets and that, that's always been our hallmark, but I was also very interested by poets older than myself. I think there's a habit nowadays to be so interested in the contemporary that the older poets are, are forgotten. So uh, th there's a whole, as it were, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a graveyard in the making, as it were, which will, which will need rediscovering at some time in the future. But in, in the youth of Carcanet, I, I had correspondences with people like Edgel Rickwood, who was one of the great uh, radicals um, with the calendar of modern letters and so on, led into the scrutinies. And he was a wonderful old man, and he used to, we used to write to each other, and I would ask him questions about people he'd known, like Hart Crane, for mm. example, and he would answer these questions. Um, th there was, uh, I was in, very friendly with uh, Charles Sisson, of course, who was my favorite poet, and probably still is, um, and he was a, a, a figure of the conservative, of a conservative kidney, and I, I learned a tremendous amount from him. And again, he w because I knew them quite well, we were unbuttoned, if you like, in our correspondence, and so there's a lot of material that you, you wouldn't get from a more formal, you know, situation. It, was a, it, it came from a kind of intimacy. So even with Laura Riding, who was notoriously, Laura Riding Jackson, as we call her, um, who was a notoriously sort of difficult person uh, in terms of her public persona, I would ask her questions about poets that she'd known, including, again, Hart Crane. I was very keen on Hart Crane, and she'd known him quite well, um, and about Graves, of course, and so on. And you tease out their vision of these people um, and you also accumulate certain indiscretions which which are kind of interesting and there they are forever um, so <laughs> I, I I did feel when we were when, when once the Rylands had acquired that library even it, it, the archive even before that I felt that part of my job was to ask the questions that a literary historian might like to know the answers to um, and I, I've always been a gossip so it's always nice <laughs> to, to tease out the gossip as well well, it's very interesting that Laura Riding famously rejected her own poems and rejected yeah. the publication and refused to be understood in anybody's yeah. terms. And yet at the back of it all, her marriage to Robert Graves yeah. and her relationships with so many other poets over the years yes. is there now, mm. in spite of her professed. <laughs> yes. And we, we, I persuaded her to, to let us republish her early poems, which are absolutely miraculous. They still are so astonishing. I don't entirely understand how they work, nor perhaps did she. I mean, they, they really do very strange things prosodically. And um, she, was, she was quite difficult, because she, she, she and Edgel Rickward both did the same thing. They both had very bad typing. Well, Edgel went blind. And so if you got a, an email from, uh, sorry, a letter from Edgel, that was pre-email times, um, sometimes he'd be a key to the left and sometimes a key. So you always had to refer to your keyboard to try and work out what he was saying. And the same was true with Laura. But Laura's right, letters were voluminous, weren't they? You, you, you have them here, don't you? And they're, they go on and on. And I don't always understand them. I didn't always read them all the way through. I mean, that, you, do, <laughs> you do find this with some correspondence. <laughs> and, the, and these are waiting um, That's right. for readers who come, who come to the archives here. At to, the <laughs> to be their first readers. <laughs> Um, you know, just the other day, I was looking at a story about Leslie Dakin, who I vaguely remember as somebody who collected children's rhymes and things like that. But there was uh, archives here, I think, which had his correspondence with um, Edgel Rickward and were restoring this 1930s radicalism where he was very involved in the Spanish Civil War. Mm -hmm. And he had all these communications. And it's one of these untold stories which all of a sudden can come into focus from the stacks of this material, which are sort of just um, waiting for us to, to rethink um, what, what we know about people. Um, well, one of the um, things that we looked at in the exhibition, which the Rylands 
posted and which nobody got to see um, because of the pandemic, um, was picking out some of the poets that Carcanet had um, published over many years. And, and one of the poets I wanted to you know, um, ask you both about is um, Sinead Morrissey, um, the Belfast poet now based in Newcastle, who's published really from, whose contact with Carcanet began as a teenager and, and who's been published all the way through published as a teenager right through um, for nearly 30 years now um, with PN Review and um, with Carcanet. And I wonder if you could talk about the kind of story that emerges for a poet like that um, in, from the archives. Yes, absolutely. As you say, there's an incredible amount of material, um, beginning with Michael's first correspondence with her. So she sends him a Christmas card and says, here's my first manuscript. And Michael says, thank you very much. You're far too young to be doing so well. Um, well, good, good luck with that. We, we, we were very, very much interested in that. Was there was fire in Vancouver, of course, which mm. is a collection that actually I believe Sinead Morrissey doesn't like anymore. Um, <laughs> but I still think it's wonderful. Um, so we have manuscripts and typescripts and notes from editors, and you can see that sort of the evolution of of the different of the different drafts um, all, all the way through to the final version, which is of course we have uh, as well. We have the Carcanet printed collection, so we have all of those. Um, we also have some wonderful material from Stephen Raw, who designed all of the covers. Um, so you can see how that was done in the 90s as well, which is very different to what he does now, of course. Um, but as you say, each of her publications can be seen sort of threaded through the collection from, from, from the 90s onwards. Um, and I know there's a, it, Sinead came back to, for a big, our big gala reading at the Rylands as well. Um, and are there recordings? Is, is that, does that also form part of what you do, those events? Yes, yes, we, have, we were hoping to include those in the exhibition, of course, um, and we'll be delighted to add that to the archive and we hope to um, a sort of a digital version of the exhibition that we hope to be putting out early next year. Oh, very good. And you, you get to see the shifts in how she writes as well as the continuities, I guess, and I suppose even in PN Review, because Sinead has published poems and essays in PN Review for 30 years right. uh, nearly as well, I think. Yeah. The next PN Review has a wonderful uh, essay by her about her, her she got a, a Medal of Freedom, I think, in, in Poland, in Gdansk, and she writes about her time there and compares her experience there and the experience of, of Lech Walesa and all the, the uh, to Belfast when she was mm -hmm. growing up and to her parents and her grandparents' experience of Belfast. And uh, it was really a very, very interesting essay. And again, I think she has this wonderful sense of history, so I think it's quite right that her archive should be this kind of comprehensive thing as well. Mm. A another poet that we picked out was Thomas Kinsella, who I think has been something of a pole star for Carcanet, um, really the great Irish poet. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, Kinsella's relationship with Carcanet, how, how that began and how that has developed, Michael. Um, uh, Thomas Kinsella was a very close friend of one of my gurus, Donald Davey, when, when Donald was teaching in, in Dublin. And uh, they were very close, and then they, they I think, fell out over, over the, the Butcher's Dozen, a, a poem about the, one of the massacres in, in Ireland, which, which um, Tom wrote. And um, I started reading him, I think, in Dennis Enright's anthology of, of uh, poetries, poetries in English, which is a wonderful anthology, which ought, we possibly ought to republish, because it's got all sorts of great writers in it, who I've discovered there, and are now Carcanet authors. Um, and I, I must have written to him. I don't remember the exact sequence of things. I must have written to him and asked if we could publish him. Uh, we, we started assembling the pepper canister pamphlets that he published with the pepper canister press into books. His aesthetic of book production at that time was far more subtle and sophisticated than ours. He was never very satisfied with the, the objects we produced. Um, but we gathered together a, a selected and then a proper collected, um, and we published quite a lot of him in, in, in PN Review as well. One of the moments that we picked out in the exhibition was the bombing of Manchester by the IRA. And I, I think probably there are a lot of the Irish writers who Cartnet had published for decades and continue to publish who were very um, affected, I guess, by this happening and one of the um, places damaged, of course, was the old um, Carcanet offices. Um, all, all the material made it into the archive, all the boxed material that was ready to go to the archive. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and about, I suppose, Carcanet's special relationship with Irish poetry. Yes. Um, 
Um, I think our special relationship with Irish poetry must have begun when Seamus Heaney asked me to publish a little booklet of poems by one of his professors. Um, the professor, I believe, had died at the time. Uh, and he, Seamus was, it must have been 1972, so it was quite early in his career. I remember meeting him at the Martyrs Memorial, a very appropriate place to meet, meet, meet with him. Um, after that, we, we, Donald Davy must have been my, my key entry into, into Irish poetry. He was very passionate about Austin Clark. He was very keen on uh, Porrick Fallon. Uh, and he kept introducing me to other Irish poets. Um, and then I had the huge excitement of, of engaging with Evan Boland. And Evan um, <coughs> brought into my orbit a lot of uh, Irish women writers, which um, made our list quite unusual in terms of, of Irish poetry. So um, I, I think the main thing about Ireland is it, is it is the one country I know where poetry actually sells. And so it, that's, not, that's not exactly an incentive to publish it, but it's always nice to think if you publish if you publish uh, you know, a new book by, by Sinead or any of our other wonderful poets, that it will, it will have a, a readership, mm. not a market, but a readership. Um, and I, I do wish other countries were like that. <laughs> I always have an illusion that Wales might be, but it, there are not enough bookshops. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is maybe an incentive for everybody who is watching, <laughs> who's watching us to, to, to check out um, what is for what is for sale, and to uh, remind Michael of his um, of his British of his <laughs> of his British book buying readership um, as well. Um, I guess that that moment, though, of the of the bombing in 1996, um, did change some aspects of the press. And I and I wondered if you could talk. Like we have there, there is like, the letters that we collected from the Irish president and from Tom Kinsella. Um, which kind of talk about their love for the press and their sorrow that it's become a casualty um, and this are really something. Um, and they tell a story of, of, of Ireland and the closeness of Manchester to, uh, to Ireland as well. Yes, I think there, there was one good effect uh, of the bomb, and that is that I used to put all the submissions on the window ledge. Um, <laughs> And I, I had a huge backlog. You know about these backlogs, don't you, John? Because we occasionally work on them together. And that window ledge fell out into the street and all of those submissions vanished. It was, it was like a dream. And then people would write and say, you haven't returned my poems yet. And I would write back and say, I'm terribly sorry, we were bombed. And then they would send money. It was, it was just oh. astonishing. Um, no, it, 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 was, uh, it was pretty traumatic. Um, the excitement was to get back in and to see what had survived um, and to find that. And we also, just as with the pandemic, we just kept on going. I, without having electronic memory, as it were, which we certainly didn't in those days. Mm. Um, email was about 10, 10 years away. Um, it, was, it is odd how, how much did survive. Yeah. You still find an awful lot of dust and, and pigeon droppings, don't you, in, the, in some of those, we those do, archival yes. boxes? <laughs> Famously footprints as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but pigeon footprints. I mean, that would be lovely, actually humans. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Um, Michael has mentioned the pandemic and the press's ability now to just to plow on regardless. What has it been like for you just to be separated from the actual archives over the last 15 months or so? Um, it's, it's not something we ever anticipated, of course, and not something we had any plans for. Um, but I think what I, what I was most surprised about was how much of my job actually can be done remotely mm. now. Um, so much of it is done via email and via the files that we, you know, the digital material that we have access to. So whilst we had to close the reading room um, for quite a long time, um, and I have a, a long stack of things that I'd like to do with our collections, um, it, it turns out that I, yeah, I, I have been able to proceed with a lot of the projects that I had ongoing, particularly with the email archive work, uh, with the externally funded projects we have there. Um, I'm actually managing a member of staff and other archivists remotely from Birmingham, and that's something we'd never have considered yeah. pre-pandemic. So we've missed the building, of course, we've missed the library. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, as Michael says, we, we, we've just sort of tried to carry on as best we can, really. I think that the Rylands is one of these kind of, one of these great libraries that Manchester is home to, but it, it's been an amazing thing to think about all of these empty spaces um, over the last 15 months, these wonderful um, tanks for learning, which are dotted around, um, around the city. Um, some of us will know you have all of these videos and images of these empty churches where, they are where the masses are recorded and played and people can watch. But it is, 
amazing for me to be back in here today. And I wonder if you could tell us about coming back in and what, what it felt like to... to oh, it's, it's like coming home. Yes, it, it feels very quickly, it feels, it feels very natural. Um, we've had to put in lots of, um, lot of restrictions, of course, because the building is, was opened in 1900 and is therefore deeply badly ventilated and things like that. So the airflow is, we've had to work on the air conditioning. Um, but we are now open, uh, the reading room is now open three days a week again, which is wonderful. And we've been using the historic reading room because there's so much more space. Um, and we hope to open to the public again um, in June, on June 24th um, for tours. So we're delighted about that. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think we have missed the space. There is a, there's a real magic in this building, yeah. um, and it's you know we're delighted to be able to bring it back to people soon. Uh, what's coming in terms of exhibitions, Jess? What are you? What are, what will people see when they're able to come back in? Because you have this great space downstairs, which has hundreds of thousands of visitors every year with different exhibitions. We are just about to launch, or just have launched, our Manchester Guardian um, anniversary oh, yes. exhibition, um, which we're very excited about, which is wonderful. Um, Two hundred years since the yeah. And that will be that is available. I love it. Can be seen online um, on our websites, um, but it will also be open in the in the space, um, which will then be followed by an exhibition on our Chinese manuscripts, which we're very excited about. Very um, yeah, so lots lots to come, lots planned. Um, but I suspect we will be moving forward in a hybrid format yeah. from now on. Great. Well, thanks very much, Jess, and uh, thank you, Michael. I think we might be. Uh, uh, welcoming people back into this space and I hope this will draw some of you back into the Rylands um, and along to other events at the Libraries Festival um, over the next few days. So we've moved over now to um, where some of the items from the uh, Carcanet at 50 exhibition um, are for us to look at on these tables in the wonderful historical reading room here at the Rylands. And what we have here is some items um, related to Thomas Kinsella um, the great Irish poet. And we have his correspondence and we also have a letter from the um, Irish president, Mary Robinson, responding to um, the uh, bombing of the Carknet offices. But what we also have here, Michael, is um, a tile. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what this tile is doing in the literary archive. It's a relic of the Corn Exchange in Manchester, a magnificent uh, Victorian building which Carcanet occupied for 27 years, a, a tiny office in the, in the attic. And the building was, was paved on the inside with these beautiful uh, green and yellow tiles. Um, and uh, when we were finally admitted back into the Corn Exchange after the bomb in 1996, uh, we gathered together uh, what material we could. And as I was leaving, I picked up two of these, these uh, tiles as a memento. And, uh, I use them as coasters for coffee cups um, in my office, and then I, I gave one to the library as part of the archive where it really belongs. How do you store those kind of materials, Jess? What? We have a wonderful conservation team um, who put together specialised packaging, and we have a box making machine that does things to certain specifications. So this has its own beautiful little box now um, where we were, yes, the conservation team were. were Delighted to hear Michael using, using it as a coaster, um, <laughs> but now, it's, now, it, now it will be preserved with the rest of the archive in an acid-free acid box. I do have another one which I still use as a coaster. <laughs> um, but some of the correspondence here, there's Thomas Kinsella and you to Thomas Kinsella, but here also is um, President Mary Robinson, um, the Irish president in 1996, Ireland's first woman president. Um, and it's a, it's a great letter, really, isn't it? And it, there's a sense of wanting what Ireland is to be represented, as well as in opposition, I suppose, to the, to the bombing and what it stood for. But what was lovely, uh, uh, Mary Robinson was, was a very close friend of Ivan Boland's, and uh, indeed, I think one of Ivan's books is dedicated to her. Uh, and so it's almost as soon as the bomb happened, uh, she and a number of other f people of, of some distinction, obviously in, in Ireland, not only our poets, wrote to us. And that was a letter which we kept framed on our wall for many years because um, we're very moved by it, actually. Um, it may be that Ivan suggested that she write, but I have a suspicion that she wanted to write. You know, she knew who we were and, and was sort of uh, wanting to as almost make amends. And, you know, it's terrible how when something like this happens in your name, you know, you, you have to dissociate yourself from it. The, the other items we have here are from one of these poets who you have, as we talked about at Carcanet, worked with across her entire, uh, the three decades of, of her writing life now. Um, 
And I know you were saying that it brought up some of the issues for you about your memory of the relationship being sometimes uh, counterfactual yeah. in relation to the evidence which is in the archives. Yes, uh, archives have, have two functions. One is that they remind you of things you've forgotten, but the other thing is they remind you of things that you've misremembered. Uh, and that's really alarming, especially if I were to sit down and write a memoir, write, write a, an autobiography, for example. Uh, would I come and consult the record? And if I did, would it erase whole areas of my memory which are very, very clear about things which didn't actually happen? Or perhaps they did happen, but in a different way. Um, uh, m memory really is, is weird. Um, there's a wonderful poem by Borges in which he talks about uh, the way we forget a language, like Latin, for example, we as, as people who've studied it, is part of our knowledge of that language, you know, the little fragments that stick. And I think archives are a bit like Latin, aren't they? they <laughs> you forget what happens, you come back and you refer, and you think, oh my gosh. And they sort of underpin everything. They do. Yeah. I mean, in the history of Carcanet, the, the bomb happened, and it was, you know, it was, it was traumatic at the time, but it hasn't had any real long-term effect, except for cementing our relations with Ireland, really. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, whenever people think of Carcanet, they think, ah, yes, they, so they had the bomb, you know, that, that sort of thing. It's, it's, um, it becomes the kind of the, the moment. A defining. You know, the defining moment, yeah. yes. And I, I wonder if the reason for that is that you did just carry on trucking, you know, you yeah. endured so spectacularly successfully that mm -hmm. perhaps what could have been the end didn't, wasn't. I remember mm. you telling me when we first talked about the exhibition that you were thinking about maybe stepping back mm. at the, at, in 96 and yeah. then of course the press needed saving yeah. so of course you stuck around and saved it so yeah. it, it kind of it changed the history of Carcanet in that way. That's perhaps. true, yes, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think for me the, as you were saying about uh, gaps, um, there are gaps, of course, because of the bomb, because, as you say, the officers were, were destroyed, so we, we lost, you know, you lost all your phone numbers and address lists, and you lost <laughs> all your submissions, and, of course, the full run of the printed works. Yes. So we have some wonderful film footage that I'm hoping to put in the, the digital mm -hmm. exhibition, mm -hmm. um, which shows the office as it was, you know, I think in August 96, you went mm -hmm. back in, yeah. um, just the once, and it, it gives a sense of the scale of, you know, of what was lost, really. Um, and that, but also that in the letter from Thomas Kinsella, you talk about um, asking people for their notes mm. um, to kind of recreate yeah. some of that, what was lost. Um, so it's not as big a hole as you'd imagine, really. No, really. but it, it, it was a hole and people were extremely helpful. Um, mm. we, we begged for furniture and, and the city library gave us two immensely heavy, beautiful tables, which are grade two listed tables <laughs> with the reader's numbers on them and, and this, you know, reader's uh, drawings on the leather top. And we still have those and I offered them back and they said, no, no, for God's <laughs> sake. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it, it, people were extremely responsive and helpful. So it, it gave, it, it made us belong more to the city than perhaps we had before. Yeah, you can really see the support in the, le you know, in the letters yeah. that people sent you afterwards. People were, you know, shocked, horrified, angry. I think Thomas Kinsella says that he's raging. I think yeah. he's really, they're, they're, they're far more upset than you seemed. I think, Michael, you, were, you, were very, you seemed to be quite philosophical about yeah. the whole, you know. The, so the poems, some of the poems that were written were beautiful. There was a beautiful poem by, by Gillian Clark and a really beautiful poem by Les Murray as well. Yeah. So it was, it was good. So it was, it was just a literary occasion. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the uh, things in the note, the exchange with um, Thomas Kinsella that you mentioned is that you know, it's happening in Manchester meant that it didn't stay national, like the support that you got was local and from poetry, but mm. that it mattered that it was uh, very unusually a publisher based outside of the London centre. Mm. Um, I wonder if you could say, we might finish at, <laughs> in this uh, festival of libraries here in Manchester, if you were able to say something about how important and defining Manchester has been as the location of the press. Mm. I can't conceive of the press without conceiving of this building, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so much part of the, uh, the texture of, of the press. And I, I know that whatever I do over there in Cross Street or whatever I did in the Corn Exchange would ultimately, bits of it, you know, shreds and ashes of it would end up in, in the Ryland. So it, that, that is that almost like a familial sense. Um, I'm also immensely fond of uh, the University Library where I used to smoke my pipe in, in the basement. You're well, killing me, Michael. <laughs> 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 and of course, Cheatham's is a, a really great library, there, there, and there are others. It's, it's just, it is a wonderful place to be. And I think um, many publishers don't necessarily nowadays think much about libraries. Um, 
because obviously they're producing ebooks and so on. They're not thinking of the history that they're making. Whereas um, had, had, had we been in London, we might not have thought in those terms. But also, I suppose the, the bomb and other things, other re relocations, make you uh, aware of how important it is to, to keep records. Um, and we, we are very close to the city, even though not uh, the bulk of our poets are international or, or national. Um, we, we do publish a number of Manchester poets as well. But we've, never, we've always been a national institution in a place. It's always thought that national institutions have to be in London. They don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, Carcanet is a signal, <laughs> a signal um, reminder um, of that. Well, thanks again, uh, Jessica Smith, Creative Arts Archivist at the Rylands, and uh, Michael Schmidt, publisher um, of Carcanet and Professor of Poetry at the University. Um, so thank you for joining us. And um, I hope that you'll get along and see um, this wonderful room for yourselves um, before long um, as everything reopens again. Thank you, Professor McCall. Thank you. <laughs>